Uh, this book really starts with my childhood. Uh, I was raised Catholic, and um, and and those those things that you hold as good um, inside of you that sort of are a center for your own barometer for how to, how to evaluate the world around you. Uh, the older we get, the more challenged they get. Um, and given that we have this global community with seven billion people in it, um, the challenges come left and right. And um, so, so this, um, so my interest in it uh, led me to the seminary. I was in the, I was in the Catholic seminary for a while, um, but but uh, I never lost the um, that that center of this being important to me. It, and I believe it's important to everybody, but it, it, it just takes a different shape. Mine came out of a Catholic background. So, um, and this was because there was such tension going on around religion, my own path had brought me to a, to a very pluralist sort of understanding of, of, of the nature of religion. And um, so this, this book came out of an intent to write, some, to put some thoughts down about my own process of thinking in this. Um, and it, it matches many other people's thoughts, but at that point it was just my voice added to a, you know, let's, let's go beyond tolerance to an actual acceptance of that diversity. So with respect to the academic environment, these are some folks that it comes out of this, this little march toward an academic approach to religion. Um, we start here with, with Durkheim, uh, studied Aboriginal religious behavior um, and viewed religion as an expression of social cohesion in human societies. By the time we get to Iliad, he argued that religious experience and human awareness of the man of, uh, 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 is human awareness of the manifestation of God, which is experienced within conceptions of the sacred. We move a little further to, to Smith, that's not Smy, um, it's T-H, not G-H. Explains that religion is equal, integral to human culture and, and is expressed in an ongoing evolution of cumulative traditions. Uh, the key word there being cumulative, because at this point you'd be, he's beginning to see it in a, in a, this is in a sense one body of work. This is, it's just expressed very differently in a cultural context, in a different cultural context. Um, and then we get to Karen Armstrong, who was a Catholic nun, and um, is a very pr prolific writer. Um, and, uh, but she focuses on the, the common under underlying reality, unity, and wisdom of the world's faith traditions. And she expresses it in, in a very personal way. Then we move along to Diane, Diana Eck, who embraces religious uh, pluralism as a believer and promotes interfaith dialogue through the pluralism, pluralism project at Harvard. So it's a, so there's, it's an awful lot of folks now that, that just are, are trying to get honest about their own sense of what is the good, what is reality, what are my most intimate experiences with that, and, and, um, and how can we free people up to talk to one another so that we're, we're not, we're not um, certainly not fighting wars over it. So, where do we start? Um, well, the first, the first, um, um, the first place to start is, is probably, in my mind, was the controversy that that came out of Darwin, and that that created this huge rift throughout, certainly the Christian community, um, and who, who found it pretty untenable to think that you know they came from apes. Um, so uh, I thought I'd, I'd you know, start there, and, and, and uh, if we look at uh, humanoids, we're looking b back at about, about 14 million years ago. Um, and we're about 5 million years um, evolved from the chimps, in terms of the, where, the, where the lines split. Um, and if you look over the last three million years or so, and some of the evidence we've collected of some of the, uh, the different predecessors to modern humans, um, these folks, uh, you know, I, the question comes in, you know, where does religion come in? 
Um, now, so we certainly, we have evidence of religion, but you have to wait till you find actually some implements. Um, the, the, um, the Anatols, we've got some evidence there that they were, they buried the dead uh, specifically and that they probably they had some rituals. So, um, so there's some indicators that there was religion there, but, but how far back does it go? It's really difficult to know. When does this kind of concern begin to evolve? And to what degree does it have to do with, with social continuity, uh, for, for group continuity? So from there, um, in order to sort of clarify what we, we know about things, um, I like Vygotsky because he was a, a social psychologist and was really concerned primarily with the development of language. Um, where did this come from? How did this evolve? Um, and he studied chimps and, um, and humans, uh, the interaction of mother and child. Um, and what, what this brought him to was, was a, a, a polarized view from the one that he, w he was sort of rebelling against Piaget's view that, that language came out of tool development. That it was fundamentally the, the uh, processes that were associated with um, our brains being able to help us develop better and better tools that allowed certain, uh, the species to evolve in that direction because they survived better because they could do tools. And that language comes out of this side of the brain. And Vygotsky differed with him and said, well, yeah, it certainly has, is, there's a relationship there. But, but it, fundamentally, it's, it's about um, language development is about social connection. Um, so I, I like these two quotes, um, the first one in particular. Uh, if at the beginning of development there stands the act independent of the word, then at the end of it there stands the word which becomes the act, the word which makes man's action free. So both humans and, and chimps, you know, their actions are set in the context of, of um, an environment, and most of, uh, of our processes are intuitive. Not, it's, it's, it's more that they're instinctive. They happen. You don't think about them. They happen. Um, and um, what happens with the word is there's a, a little interruption. There is a, you're stepping aside from that, and you have a separate view of it. Um, this, so there is a conceptual process that allows you to stand aside from the thing itself so you have a separate consciousness. Well, I'll go there later. All right, uh, so the second quote, the forming of the complex human unity of speech and practical operations is the product of a deeply rooted process of development in which the subject's individual history is closely linked to his social history. So in order to get a handle on this, um, basically he said that language doesn't evolve primarily or only from practical operations or the use of tools, but the beginning of language in the individual is social. Infant, the infant uses the mother to problem solve. Um, and triangulation over problem solving requires the unity of two selves. So each of us has two selves. We have the one that is the separate self and the other that is us. Um, and we see ourselves in each other. If we couldn't do that, we would have no audience to talk to. You could not triangulate. Um, the chimps, you can teach chimps three or four hundred words um, via sign language and they can communicate with human beings. They can't communicate with each other using it at all. Um, so, uh, uh, so because somebody has to see the other as themselves. Um, and human beings can see animals too. I mean, they can identify themselves in the animal to a certain degree. Uh, not necessarily the full link that you're going to get from a human being because they can't look back. They don't see you back. They respond to you back. Um, so human awareness 
of the other is the matrix out of which language and religion develops. Um, it, it, it provides a, transcend, a transcendent freedom of choice and action with respect to each other that is unavailable to the primate. Anyway, oops. Okay, we got it. Yeah. One back. Okay. So now we now we move into religion because because now you have you have the fundamental point at which religion comes from, which is um, you have a separate self and you have a unified self, um, which makes the the separate self alone um, because your unified self is needs fulfillment and it's empty without the experience of the other. Um, so here, here we have an opening line in Genesis. What I did with this book throughout is I went to scripture to see if my, my own gut that, you know, there's one reality, and if I'm experiencing these things, I don't care if you're a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, you know, you're going to have this this interaction with other folks, and you can have a, some sense of what the sacred is, some sense of what reality is. That is, um, that is fundamental to being human and having a, and experiencing this this aloneness and togetherness. Um, so, uh, I go to the scriptures, and and as you go to the scriptures, I mean, my interpretation of them is that I can find them. It's it's. It's cherry picking, but it's cherry picking to say, you know, I have things I want to answer. Do they answer these things everywhere? Well, they do. They, they are talking about the same situation, the same human being. So they, as it turns out, from my perspective, they, they're basically talking about the same reality. So I, at that point, that was the center of the book. That's where it came from, is that I want to show that. And I started going to uh, scripture. I also spent 10 or 15 years every Friday night having dinner discussions over religion with Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Christians and uh, Jews. So, so we we um, um, so we shared scripture and and we and at that point. So I'm going here to scripture. I'm going to Christian scripture to begin with because that's really where um, most folks um, uh, in my neighborhood uh, are, are familiar. Uh, so this is Genesis 1:14-15. Um, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night and let, there be, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of, of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. So here's my translation. Here's my take on that. Let there be means for discerning spiritual and temporal, temporal reality for the progress and development of humankind with respect to the heaven of the will of God and the will of humankind on the earth. So um, at that point, it, 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 uh, there's some ambiguity here, I'm sure, and you might, what do I mean by God? Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more as we move along. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made, made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And my take on that, God made the light of the Spirit of God, the, sun, the reference up there is the sun, um, to rule the spirit of humankind and the light of the soul of humankind to rule the actions of humankind. He provided teachers in both realms, the stars. So uh, scripture generally is, my take on scripture that is, is that it's, it's, it's poetry. It's poetry of the spirit, the human spirit. Um, it's also poetry of the rational mind. Um, but, uh, but throughout the scriptures, you, you find references to two aspects of, of human consciousness. One that is transcendent, which an, an example of that is the relationship between the mother and child. Um, it is this, this, the side of us that can experience unity. Uh, you can't hold that in thought. It, it has a reflection in thought, but you can't hold it in thought. You can experience yourself in the other, but you can't hold the other in thought. 
you can even experience the other without them being present. Um, uh, that that um, the reference there is to the, the spirit. The, the human spirit has the capacity to transcend. The human soul is thought, emotion, memory. Um, it's the constructs and the images that we can that we can accumulate. Um, they are, but they are they are impressions, and they are um, they are our separate understanding of reality, rather than a unified one. In the context of of the scriptures, people report um, throughout human history in all sorts of of, of ways, in, in their art and in their in their um, their writing that they have experiences of God. Um, now, it's all the scriptures make it pretty clear that the author of reality is totally and completely unknowable, absolutely unreachable and unknowable. At the same time, they all say you know, that, that our, our whole purpose is to know that unknowable. Um, which is which is the paradox that sits on all of us, because it's certain I can I understand the difference between when I am unified with a human being and when I notice that and that experience and when I am separate. Um, so um, I notice this void when it's gone, and every now and then um, I, I've you know been been doing prayer and meditation since I was young. I do it every day, and it's so it's part of my life's. Uh, experiences, and so I put a lot of effort into uh, meditation, prayer and meditation. And there are times when I have experiences that are, they cannot fit in thought, and it's very clear they can't fit in thought. They can't even fit close to my consciousness in terms of the consciousness I, I normally have. Um, so, and there's lots of folks that report these experiences, and, um, and, and it's my belief that this is because that's who we are. We have this capacity, even if for the most part we don't experience it. And I can go from intense meditation and connection to you know somebody outside honks, honks, and I say, "Who's that jerk?" You know. It's like, so you know you you can, you know so you lose it very quickly, and it's like you you I can approach, I can make the effort to move toward it. I cannot do it. I can't think myself there. I cannot emote myself there. Um, I make efforts and it happens. Um, so, which is this really interesting thing because sometimes it happens that I wasn't even trying. Um, so, so but, but I think this is available to all of us, but I think this is a process of learning that is fundamentally what we're about here. But it's not the only way to learn and you don't necessarily, um, the, the, the variety of, of, of experiences that human beings have have here are infinite. Each individual's experience is infinitely unique. <laughs> so, so you, you and and so, you know, the the, the majority of embryos, um, to some, by some estimates in some studies, eighty percent of them are cast aside. They never make it. They don't ever even implant. But they're fertilized. That's a human being on the trajectory. But it it doesn't make it. Um, so, um, at least here. But, but what, is, what is the destiny of humanity and at what point in its, its evolution is there a connection? Um, the, um, in, in, the, in the discussions that so many of the scriptures have about, about being, one of the things that comes up again and again is the term that uh, Christ used, um, uh, the term the Alpha and the Omega. Um, to describe the nature of, of, of his own uh, identity um, because he was basically casting himself as the manifestation of God, as, as, a, as a reference point, as that's who he, his identity is, not his body, not his physicalness, not anything he did uh, in terms of physical, that's not God, but, but, but the reference is if you... Uh, Try to pay attention to what he's what, what you, you know, the twelve typewritten pages or so that he's quoted in the New Testament. You, you have to make these connections that that give you bring you somewhere that you, is transcendent. Um, so that is before and after. That's the Alpha and the Omega. There is 
time has little consequence there, uh, which Einstein would remind us of later with a very different way of looking at it. But it's the same uh, principle. So basically, the religions are reflections and expressions of meaning, understanding, and guidance in the realms of both the spiritual and the temporal exigencies of human personal and social evolution, and are unified within the oneness of reality, speaking for itself to the human spirit. So um, the spiritual and the temporal are just our, you know, we may have spiritual experiences, but they work their way into our conceptual framework. They help us to form it to grow it, to mold it, and shape it. And that helps shape our actions. So we're less likely to say, that jerk, you know. So, but at any rate, but it's an effort any way you go about it. So, all right, from here, I'm going to move into some scriptures. And I'm going to talk about one of two themes here. And I'll use the scriptures to do this. So this is, um, we're going to talk about the unity of religion. And I'll basically uh, pull from these scriptures. So Hinduism, like the bee gathering honey from different flowers, the wise man accepts the essence of different scriptures and sees only the good in all religions. Rabbi Yohanna ben Zakkai said, just as the sin offering atones for Israel, so righteousness atones for the peoples of the world. These are not exclusive statements. These are totally inclusive statements. The Buddha says, to be attracted to a certain view and to look down upon other views as inferior, this the wise man call a fetter. And Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Islam, unto each nation we have given sacred rights, which they are to perform. So let them not dispute with you of the matter, but you summon to your Lord. This is from the Baha'i Faith. There can be no doubt that whatever the peoples of the world, of whatever race or religion, they derive their inspiration from one heavenly source and are the subjects of one God. So that's, that's a, and the thing is, the reference points are over and over and over again throughout scriptures. You know, they, they, the, there, is, there is confusion that happens, um, but I'm going to go into that with the next thing, the, which is this, the station of the messenger. So at that point, we've got, we've got, okay, they're all saying that everything's okay, then what's all the fighting about? And how come Buddhists do it very differently than Hindus, who do it very differently than, than the Jews, or the, you know, okay, what's that about? And, and how come we're doing so much struggle over that? So when you talk about the nature of the messenger, there are some, some, some clues. And the best way to go there to, to get some clues about that is to, to look at the scriptures that, where they're talking about the nature of the messenger. So this is Christianity. This is from God's, John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, as the glory, as his glory, glory as of the, the only Son of the Father. So, I mean, that certainly looks pretty exclusive. Um, so, the only Son of the Father. Um, so let's, but let's, let's move on and get some sense of that. Okay, because this isn't, a, well, no, let me go further. So we have a very similar statement. Here's Buddhas, Buddhism. I am the Tathagata. So now we're referring to the one with, that was referring to Christ. This is referring to Buddha. I am the Tathagata, the most honored among men. I appear in the world like unto this great cloud to pour enrichment upon all parched living beings, to free them from their misery, to attain the joy of peace, the joy of the present world, and joy of nirvana. In Hinduism, fools misjudge me when I take a human form, because they do not know my supreme state as lord of beings. 
unconscious, they fall prey to beguiling natures such as belongs to ogres and demons, for their hopes ascribing to God human motives are vain, and so are their rituals and their search for wisdom. And this one is from the Baha'i Faith. It's much elongated, but it's much, it, at this point, it, it reiterates the same statement about the nature of the messenger. But here it does it with a, this is, this is, you know, these are modern scriptures. These are, you know, um, 19th century um, scriptures. The Baha'i Faith is about 170 years old. Since there can be no tie, direct tie or no tie of direct intercourse to bind the one true God with his creation and no resemblance whatever can ever exist between the transient and the eternal, the contingent and the absolute, he hath ordained that in every age and dispensation a pure and stainless soul be made manifest in the kingdoms of earth and heaven. Unto this subtle, this mysterious and ethereal being he hath assigned a twofold nature, the physical pertaining to the world of matter and the spiritual, which is born of the substance of God himself. So we're back around to let there be light. There's the sun, there's the moon, there's the spirit, there's the soul. Well, we've got spirit and soul here. God hath moreover conferred upon him, the messenger, a double station. The first station, which is related to his innermost reality, represented him as one Whose, whose voice is the voice of God himself. To this testifieth the tradition, manifold and mysterious is my relationship with God. I am he himself, and he is I myself, except that I am that I am, and he is that he is. And in like manner the words, Arise, O Muhammad, for lo, the lover and the beloved are joined together and made one in thee. He similarly saith, There is no distinction whatsoever, between thee and them, except that they, that they are thy servants. So um, now th th this, gets, this gets very hard to grasp intellectually, and that's why we kind of come up with things like the Trinity to try to explain this. Um, but it, it's throughout all of, of the scriptures, and um, it gets confusing because what it's, what it's saying here is, is that The, the, there's this statement that Christ makes, for example, where he's talking about um, that if you know him, you know the Father. So he's making this identity statement that he is the very presence of God, the voice of God. He is this transcendent being. Um, uh, at, at the same time, he turns around and said, and I will make you all sons of God. Well, you know, well, but then he says he's the only son of God. There's only one of those, but he's going to make you all sons of God. That's because at the, at the tra transcendent point that anyone hears the voice of God, it is God. And at that point, you, you, you are, there is no differentiation. You can't have a separate self there. Um, so there isn't a distinction. There is a presence and a unity and the realization that that entity sustains your entity and is your entity because you can't be separate. Um, so there is an identity statement um, that is made in being. Um, so this is the transcendent point. But these particular focal points, like Buddha, Zoroaster, Krishna, um, they are they're human beings and they're walking around on the earth like anybody else, subject to death, subject to hunger. Um, so, so, but, but they walk in the presence of the reality that sustains them, and they speak only from that position. Um, so in speaking from that, um, or, or let me say they are enriched to a point in, in their speaking that they are addressing the whole of humanity for a particular period of time. They are messengers. They are intended to be here, and they are intended for guidance. This is the sun uh, and the moon um, in, uh, in human evolution in terms of its spiritual maturation. Um, so they are, um, and they, they periodically show up. But it, the reason they show up is because it's like Jesus was talking about, you know, what are you here for? We have Moses, we don't need you. And he said, well, um, one, he said, if you knew Moses, you know me. So it was an identity state. But the other thing he said is, you can't put new wine in old wineskins, they split. 
Um, well, it's, it's at that point, he's, what, he's, what he's talking about is you're, you're sitting in a new age here. In this new age, um, you, you know, you can't try and fit it into these, these, an old conceptual framework. It won't work. It, it splits the framework. You, you can't do it. Um, they, the messengers come and address the age they're living in and the age from there on there, uh, to the next messenger for the period of time that this particular dispensation of light um, is going to be effective in integrating into the physical realms. So, because the physical cultural realms are expressed, the moon of understanding is, um, is, is uh, uh, changes. Um, so, the face of the moon changes rather readily. Um, so, we, we, you, you, at that point, as you unfold, I mean, we, we were very different when we were, when we were 10 and are thinking about the nature of God than you are when you're in your teens or when you're in, in, your, in your 50s. You know, you, you change, your conceptual framework changes, but so does your integration of that experience change and what you do about it changes. So this is the messenger, and we, and we get messengers that come periodically. The second station uh, of the messenger is the human station, exemplified by the following verses. I am but a man like you. Say, praise be to my Lord. I am more than a man, and I am more than a man, an apostle. These essences of detachment, these resplendent realities, are the channels of God's all-pervasive grace. Led by the light of unfailing guidance and invested with supreme sovereignty, they, commission, they, they are commissioned to use their, the inspiration of their words, the effusions of their infallible grace, and the sanctifying breeze of their revelation for the cleansing of every longing heart and receptive spirit from the dross and dust of earthly cares and limitations. Okay, so now I'm going to move from there to some teachings of the Baha'i Faith. Um, and these teachings have to do with with, so you had a, a messenger that came uh, about 170 years ago, and basically a reiteration of the same fundamental principles of the nature of reality. Uh, and, um, and, but at that point, it articulates um, some teachings, specific teachings, to the current uh, age. The thing that, that should be, uh, you know, th th that has become clearer and clearer to me is that um, I ran into the faith, Baha'i faith, um, when I was in my mid-20s. Um, but initially, my reaction to it was, they, 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 they told me about these teachings, ran through the tenets. And I said, well, you know, I figured that out a long time ago. Um, it, most people, um, you know, reading scripture, uh, any scriptures, and trying to look at the age that they're in, you know, if they're getting the spiritual message out of the scriptures they're reading, I'm going to come up with those tenets. That's, you know... Um, a no-brainer, but, but I didn't really want to have anything to do with this new messenger concept. It was, it was, a, it was, a, it was okay to look back a, a ways and say, okay, I can accept Buddha, you know, but, but a new one, uh, come on. Um, so I wasn't really interested at first. Uh, um, and my friend who introduced me to the face, the, uh, he was just passing through, um, dropped some, he said, Here, here's some books, take them to the library. I said, yeah, I can do that. But I kept them for a while because I figured, well, I'll read them first. And uh, that's all it took. <laughs> I read them. So, so okay, so this is, this is a statement from one of the figures of the faith um, and um, clarifying the nature of um, this, this religious faith or dispensation. The Baha'i message is a call to religious unity and not an invitation to a new religion, not a new path to immortality. It is the ancient path cleared of the debris of imaginations and superstitions of men, and the debris of strife and misunderstanding, and has again made a clear path to the sincere seeker that he may enter therein in assurance and find that the word of God is one work, though the speakers were many. So here are the, here are the basic tenets. There's one God, one religion, one people, one flock, one shepherd, there always has been. Their underlying unity is just beginning to be realized globally because of the ascendancy of science and technology and the convergence of the world's people, peoples into one community. So, you know, religion has always been, its primary function was to unite people, was to put them together, 
was to help to unify them. And this was, you know, this is, this is the studies earlier about, well, you know, even in the primitive societies, it was a social force of social cohesion. Um, and it always meant to group larger and larger groups. And the, and the messengers that came, as they had bodies of, or, or groups of folks who stayed in one location, they evolved one religious understanding and ideology, even though that at times, like Roman, Roman times, you know, it was, um, there were many gods and they were all accepted. That's because you know, it, it, it was, they were all legitimate. Um, there were just that, that city-state's understanding and conceptual framework for the experience. Each individual is responsible for the development of his or her own relationship with God. It is the time for the individual to independently investigate the truth. Religious and civil law are to reflect this essential human capacity and responsibility. So this is, this is the time when th there's an unfolding capacity both spiritually and, um, and culturally, socially for human beings, technologically for human beings. Um, so there is, there is a corresponding spiritual enlightenment that is moving along so that, that people can see what the Buddha saw, can see what Jesus saw, can see what, what the saints saw. Rather than just the teachings, there is more and more uh, people are themselves perceiving the spiritual reality um, for themselves and being able to interpret, it, interpret scripture for themselves and understand what it means, both spiritually, a connection with God, and also, I mean, these have always been available in religions, but typically you, you had a few that would get things, and, and everybody else sort of, they were the teachers, and you did what you were told. Um, they were the accepted wise ones. And there was an orthodoxy, which formulated that everybody had to sort of fit into. Um, anything extraneous or outside of that was generally unacceptable. So, um, but at any rate, um, this is, we've come to a period of time where, where educa education can proliferate. Everybody really can m move here for themselves. It's not up to me to tell somebody else what it means. It's not very helpful at all. Um, it is most helpful for the individual to have their own search, their own struggle with it, their own struggle and fight with it, because we all fight with it. We don't, we don't just get it, we fight with it. All differences, gender, class, racial, religious, cultural, are to be respected and embraced. All are to participate equitably in global community. Um, this is just, we are now global. So this is the next level of unity, is, is, it is global unity. Special emphasis is given to the, to, in the teachings of the faith addressing the social parity of men and women. Um, there, are, there are separate evolutions here. Um, they're, they're linked, they're, they're inter, integral to each other, but they're separate evolutions both physically and socially, um, there are different evolutions. So because the social responsibilities were different because of the physical difference in their, in their, um, their capacities. One can give birth and one can't. Um, and, and all sorts of things are associated with that. But in that context, the, social co the constructs of the social order have been imbalanced in terms of the social structures. Uh, who controlled the social structures. It was primarily men. Uh, it was a male proclivity. The internal ones to a family may have had a great deal of influence from a woman, but, but, um, but not the, the structures of society. That is, uh, uh, in this age, changing very rapidly. Um, and they, from uh, the teachings of, of the Baha'i faith, they are seen as critical for the evolution of the capacity this, this latent um, in global culture and for its peaceful development, particularly. The development of human capacity is to be assisted through the global implementation of education for everyone. And this is just kind of a no-brainer. If we want to be able to govern ourselves now, it's clear we're going to have to make sure that, that we're, we all have access to education. Education must address the mind and the heart science and faith reach harmony and productivity through dialogue. Faith provides reason with meaning and purpose. Science guards faith from superstition. The dialogue is essential. It must continue. Um, the, um, the, the, the one, you know, I, I remember my first exposure to, um, to Camus and, and, and Sartre, and it's like the, the existential 
you know, dive off the cliff. Uh, <laughs> it was, it's like, uh, oh yeah, wow, okay, there is, there is nothing. There is a coldness that, that, that is so penetrating and so pervasive and so eternal in nature that it is just, um, it, it's beyond thought, it's so dark. Um, and it's like, well, that's where we can go now. You know, we have this available. Um, so, um, so where is this? And you try to hang your hat on, you know, uh, chase after something to keep you occupied. You know, and if, you, if you're chasing after something to keep you occupied rather than actually have something that solves that riddle um, and fills that, that emptiness, um, what you end up with is a lot of addictions to a lot of things that, that you know, keep you running so that you don't have to look. Um, so, so the, the, you know, we, we are, one way or the next, we got, we've got to fight with this. Um, and, and it's not like spirituality is something that you, you get and it's done. You know, you, you, you know, it must be challenged by the, by the intellect, by experience. And everything, everything in the world challenges my faith and continues and will continue to challenge it. Even with this, these incredible experiences I get in meditation and have throughout my life, um, I doubt it. I doubt it instantaneously after it's gone. How could, what was that? What was that? You know, did I, did my brain fart? You know, this is, this is something that just, you know, I just wanted it or something, but no, I can't get it by wanting it. Um, I, I can't manufacture it, but the experience is so intensely beautiful um, and it's a unity, but it's a unity of being. And it's very similar to, to what you experience when you give way to another person when you don't need to because you realize you're being stupid, you know, and, you, know, and, and you, 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 rather than go for pride, you go for, for together. And the together is fulfilling. Um, but, but, um, but it's always going to be challenged again. You know, there will be another, another hiccup you're going to have to deal with. But science at that point is... Because our, our religious experiences or our spiritual experiences build a framework of understanding in our, uh, in our soul or that part of us which is separate, um, uh, we, we can stand alone with it and we have avenues back to uh, attempts to make peace with others, attempts to, you know, we practice and as you practice you, get, you actually do get a little better. The extremes of wealth and poverty are to be eliminated if the world's peoples are to rid themselves of tumult. This is not to be accomplished solely through the development of political or economic systems. Solution also requires spiritual and cultural maturity in the development of human economy. So th this is, it just calls on, you know, you better balance with men and women and the, rather, the not just the destructive force side, but you better get the, the creative um, uh, uh, fluid side that can, that can bend too. Um, so, because um, you, you need at times stability and strength, but at other times you really do need uh, gentleness. Um, so, um, but, but the extremes of wealth and poverty at that point uh, have to do a lot with understanding the nature of not just can I go out there and get all I can get and compete, um, but uh, am I a participant in, in, in something that, that really needs to be supported and there are lots of people who cannot compete at the, at, in the way that I can at the moment. That at that point we owe stuff to each other. Uh, that we owe justice to each other. And that, that you have to continually search for that. But you have to be willing to look. Um, this, is, uh, uh, the, uh, this is not actually a call for it to be forced. It's a call for it to be taught so that we will choose to do this. Um, and, and we can see expressions of this happening in our own times. We're seeing, you know, the rich coming around saying, no, you know, tax me. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's reasonable. And, um, and, and it's really clear to me that uh, this wasn't just because I'm, I'm so great and capable. It's because I was in the right place at the right time. Um, and that's why I have the wealth. Um, the people of the world need to select or create a secondary world language through which the practical and spiritual unity of the world's peoples will be expressed and its culture established. Um, this is a practical thing. Almost every group of people anywhere that have different languages and they have to trade with other and, uh, each other and deal with each other form a common speak. Um, so that, you know, it's what well, French for was for the, the common speak for a while. Um, 
and um, English at the moment seems to be a common speak. I, I spent a little time studying his, uh, um, what's it called, Esperanto. Um, and it's like, now, now, now if you create a language, that's my idea of the ideal, create one, because you know you can make it simple. It doesn't have to be complex. When you let the, the, the course of the social history of the language develop it, you know, it, it's really, you know, not logical and reasonable. It's just what it is. But, but if you create one, you can make it logical. You can make it reasonable. You can take um, words that, that, you know, that we share an awful lot of words in common uh, for in the different languages. So you, you try and move it toward common cognate, cognates as much as possible. And you strip it of the difficult things and the illogical things. And you, and you make the grammar really easy to deal with. And it becomes the common speak. You can speak everywhere. Everyone, everyone those, learns one language. And you know, if we did this, if we decided globally to either create one or choose one, if we decided to do that, and we all decided to teach it to the, to the, to the children of the world, in one generation time, we wouldn't have a problem with language anywhere we went. So it's, it's just reasonable. It's logical. And it's likely to happen at some point, probably over a fairly slow, long and slow evolution. Global governance by law must replace war as the arbiter of disputes. We are in the final stages of nation building. It is now time to safeguard all of the world's borders with the creation of a binding set of rules for the peaceful integration of the world's peoples. We're too big for war and must instead set policy and settle conflicts through political, consultative, and legal processes. So this is just where we're at. Um, peace is a lot of work. Um, but, but I don't know if any of you are familiar with Steven Pinker and a work he's, he's done. Um, he, he did a, he did a, a, a mega study of studies of, of violence in, in human society, the death of individuals, one on the other. And what it came up with basically throughout the agricultural age until about 500 years ago, the, about the average rate of death, about half of it internal to the culture and about half of it with war with other cultures. Uh, but, you know, internal, it's family feuds, it's feuds with, I mean, it's, uh, you know, at any rate. Um, but as it turns out, the average for that period of time was about um, 1,000 people per 100,000. It's 1% 1 of the population per annum um, per year on average was sort of a norm until about 500 years ago and it started to change when we started rather rapidly evolving new technologies for war, new technologies for uh, how we uh, live together and trade together, and uh, our structure of wealth was changing. Um, so we were moving off of land for, for, for land for, for the only thing you needed to get armies, because now it was, it was how, how efficient were you with the use of the land in order, and with trading in order to buy your food from somewhere so that you could supply an army um, through commerce, and you wouldn't need just land to do it. So, and, uh, and serfs, eight, you know, 80% of the population had to be producing the food to keep the army running to keep those people at bay. So, but at any rate, it started declining. Um, by the time you hit the first half of the 20th century with the two world wars in it, instead of 1,000 people per 100,000, 1%, it's down to 60 people per 100,000. Um, since World War II, it's down to about five-eighths of a person per 100,000. So we're becoming much, much more peaceful. And we're, we're becoming much more sensitive to human beings and how they live on the planet and how we're living on the planet and how we're living with the planet. Uh, and not just the people on the planet, but, but the vegetation and the animals on the planet. Uh, we're concerned about whether or not those butterflies are going to survive. Um, so we're becoming very, very sensitive. This is a spiritual maturation as well as a physical maturation. Um, it's not just political systems, it's sensibilities. But, but they evolve more and more sensitive political systems that are, that are more fluid and flexible and capable of, of handling a, a global community of 7 billion people. We made it to the end.